Welcome back, everybody, to part two of chapter two. Uh, remember where we left off last time? We were talking about that idea of sustainability, or the idea that your current actions are not going to reduce your future opportunities and how that relates to the production possibilities curve. Right? Remember that if we're talking about a sustainable practice, we're talking about a practice that is going to not reduce or shift in that production possibilities curve. It's either going to keep the curve where it is, or it's going to expand it outward, allowing you to produce more in the future rather than less. So we're going to move from that idea into this idea of assimilative capacity. So assimilative capacity is the ability of the natural system to accept a certain amount of pollutants and render them either uh, benign or inoffensive. Right? So it's the ability of the environment to handle a certain amount of pollution without suffering any uh, extreme or severe uh, damage. Right. So the important thing about simulative capacity is it gives us the idea that maybe we don't have to have zero pollution out there. In other words, it might be worth it to produce some market goods, even if those market goods create some pollution, because the world can handle a certain amount of pollution without suffering any severe negative consequences or without shifting in that production possibilities curve or, again, keeping us uh, sustainable for the future. So we don't necessarily need to produce zero market goods in an effort to preserve the environmental quality. In fact, economists tend to argue that anything worth doing is worth doing imperfectly, and that includes preserving the environment. So it's probably not necessary to have, again, a pristine environment where you have absolutely zero pollution and you're focused entirely on environmental quality. In fact, a lot of economists would argue that that's not worth it. Right? Perfection in general isn't worth it just because it is too costly to achieve. Economists are usually about finding this idea of an equilibrium, right? There's a certain amount of something that you should be doing, and then once you go too far and do it too much, the costs start to outweigh the benefits, and you want to reduce the, uh, the activity. In order to help illustrate this idea, I have a quick video clip here for you from the show uh, or the movie, Along Came Polly. Uh, to kind of set up this clip, there are two characters. There's Ruben, who is a risk analyst who's excessively neat and kind of always crunches the numbers and looks at everything. And uh, it's, uh, getting neat to the point where it's kind of started to ruin his life or become fairly inefficient for him. And then he meets a young lady named Polly who's excessively messy to the point where that becomes relatively inefficient for her. So again, they're going to meet and kind of uh, find an equilibrium between the two of them and uh, both be better off as a result. Let's take a look at the clip. Okay, so throw pillows go in this cabinet here. Oh, you don't, you don't sleep on these? No, no, they're decorative. For who? What do you mean? I mean, you're the only one who sees them, but you don't sleep on them. Then you take them off the bed every night, put them in the box, take them out of the box, put them out of the... I just don't understand the point. I don't know. I mean, Lisa thought they looked nice. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. I see what the big deal is. Make the bed look nice. Hey! What are you doing? That's goose down. I'm liberating you. Try it! No! I'm not gonna... Just one stab. Come on, see how you feel. Come on! This is ridiculous. Oh, not ridiculous. It, it's not like driving a knife into a pillow is suddenly gonna make me feel... Wow, that feels really good. Huh? Right? <laughs> yeah! What did I tell you? You know what? You're right. Go on, bigger one. What is the point of these things, really, right? No point. Ha! Ha! Stupid! Ha! 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 I mean, what am I, running a bed and breakfast? <laughs> Not anymore! You know how many minutes a day I spend getting the throw pillows on and off the bed? How many? Four minutes in the morning, four minutes at night. That's eight minutes of my life. I figured it out. It's 56 minutes a week. It's nearly two days of my life a year I spend putting pillows on and off a stupid bed! <laughs> ha! 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what? I really got to go. I'm late. Shoot. What's wrong? Did you lose your keys again? No, they're just not where I left them before. Hey, why don't you use that key finder I bought you? Ruben, I don't... I think it could help. ...need the stupid key finder! All right. Anyway, I was thinking I'd come meet you. Really? Um, I, I thought you hated dirty dancing clubs. No, no, it's just salsa. It'll be fun. I'll watch. Hey, what's that noise? Nothing. It's the key finder, isn't it? Oh, it's still not the key finder, okay? Yes, it is. It is not the key finder. I'll see you later. Bye. Yes, it is. 
So as you can see from the clip, uh, Ruben gets a little less organized, Polly gets a little more organized, and they both kind of reach an equilibrium that makes both of them better off. So kind of moving forward with this idea, uh, so economists often get in trouble or the uh, group of academics that say least likely invited to dinner because they make some statements that at first sound rel relatively insensitive or insane, right? But after hearing the explanation, well, you might be thinking, well, of course that's true, and now that starts to make a little bit of sense. For example, an economist might make a statement such as there might be an optimal number of plane crashes that are non-zero. That's a tough thing to say to somebody, uh, particularly somebody that they've lost a uh, family member in a plane crash. But let's think about why an economist might say that. So right now, the chances of dying in a plane crash are pretty low. Right? They, uh, uh, there's all kinds of safety measures taken by the airlines, and you do have to go through a security line. And, you have to, and when you step on the plane, you have a, uh, a couple of highly trained pilots in the front, and they have things like a fuel gauge and a backup fuel gauge, a lot of things to keep you safe. But you're not perfectly safe, right? What if in order to be perfectly safe or reduce the number of plane crashes or the chance of a plane crash happening down to zero, you had to do something like instead of just going through one security line, you had to go through two security lines. And then that second one, you had to strip completely naked to make sure you weren't hiding anything that you could use to hijack the plane. What if also when you got on the plane, instead of having two uh, seasoned pilots up in the front, you might have four just in case something happens to two, those uh, two? What if instead of having a backup fuel gauge, you also have a uh, backup backup fuel gauge? What if instead of having, say, a six emergency exits, you have 12? There's a lot of things you can do that will reduce your chance of dying in a plane crash. Now, the problem with doing all these things is it would make flying incredibly expensive. So expensive that when people are deciding whether or not to fly or drive, because the cost of plane tickets have gone up as a result of all these increased safety measures, they might choose to drive instead. Well, which is statistically more dangerous when traveling? That's, of course, driving. You're much more likely to die in a car accident than you are in a plane crash. So if you have a lot of people choosing to drive instead of fly because you've increased the cost of flying so much, then you might actually increase the total number of traveling-related fatalities. So good. There. So again, there is an optimal number of plane crashes that might be non-zero, right? Now there might also be an optimal number of coronavirus deaths that are non-zero, and I know that's kind of tough for people to hear, especially right now. And again, especially if you lost somebody to this virus. But let's think about why we might say that. So according to the uh, World Health Organization, these uh, social distancing measures that the United States is currently taking and might have to take for the rest of this year could save an estimated about 600,000 lives. But according to economists, uh, all these social distancing measures that involves companies shutting down and not operating and people staying in their homes and not traveling and uh, things like that, that could cost us about 30% of our GDP or gross domestic product, which is the level of uh, economic activity in the country. And so that 30% of GDP might be as much as uh, $6.6 .6 trillion dollars that we would have made but are not making because of these social distancing measures. So this actually comes out to about $11 million per life saved. Now, if you're thinking, well, that still might be worth it. It might be worth $11 million to save a life. After all, how do you put a price on life? Well, it's pretty hard to do, but economists have kind of figured out a way to do it. One way to put a price on life is in terms of other lives. In other words, could we save even more lives with that $11 million? So if we didn't do all the social distancing, but we operated as we normally did and uh, um, made the money that we normally would have made, and then we donated that money to another cause, could we save more lives with it? And as it turns out, we might be able to. Right? In fact, you, could, uh, you can actually uh, feed, clothe, shelter, vaccinate, and educate 695 children in Africa uh, for the full 18 years of their childhood for that $11 million. Right. So in other words, again, we're spending $11 million per life saved over in the United States. We could use that same $11 million, maybe not to save one life in the U.S., but to save 695 African children. So again, is there an optimal number of corona deaths that are non-zero? It's tough to make that claim, but there indeed might be at some point. It might not be worth it to continue practicing social distancing measures, especially when you consider all the other good that could be done with the money that gets created from uh, operating as we normally would. So I know that's kind of, both those are kind of tough to hear, but that doesn't make them any less true. 
So with that in mind, there might be an optimal amount of pollution that is non-zero, especially given the fact that the Earth has an assimilative capacity that allows it to accept some pollution and render it uh, um, non-lethal to the environment or inoffensive. Right. So with that in mind, in Chapter 5 of this particular class, we'll actually be using some math to calculate out the optimal amount of pollution. And again, mo in most cases, in fact, in all cases that we do in this class, you're going to get a non-zero level of emissions. So let's go ahead and continue through with some of these definitions. Let's talk a little bit about cumulative versus non-cumulative pollutants. So a non-cumulative pollutant is uh, pollution that exists as long as the source is present, but it fades out of existence uh, when the source shuts down. So an example of this might be noise pollution, right? So when something's out there making a lot of noise that's uh, disturbing the environment or hurting your ears, right? As long as it's making that noise, that pollution is present. Well, as soon as that noise pollution is turned off, then that noise is no longer happening. The environment returns to the level that it was at before that noise pollution existed, right? So nothing is being added uh, to the environment that isn't going to go away as soon as the source of pollution is shut down. So again, that's what we call a non-cumulative pollutant. Now, a cumulative pollutant is pollution that accumulates in the environment in nearly the same amount that it is emitted and continues to exist even after that source is stopped. So this pollution will continue to exist in the environment even after the source of the pollution has gone away. So an example of that might be like plastics out in the ocean. So we talked about the plastic bag ban last chapter. If we stop producing those single-use plastic bags, that doesn't get rid of all the plastic bags that have already been produced and are currently floating around the ocean, right? Every plastic bag we produce, they, that can get added to those plastics that are floating out there in the ocean. In other words, it can, can accumulate in our environment and it will still be there even after the uh, source of that pollution has stopped, right? Uh, radioactive waste is another one of these things, right? Uh, with radioactive waste, um, the uh, uh, pollution will uh, continue to exist even after that source stops, right? So if that radioactive waste gets out there in the environment and we stop producing radioactive waste, it doesn't make the radioactive waste that's already been produced go away. So again, a non-cumulative pollutant is a pollutant that exists as long as the source is present, but will stop as soon as the uh, source shuts down. A cumulative pollutant is pollution that accumulates in the environment in about the same amount that it is emitted, and again, will continue to exist even after that source is stopped. With that in mind, let's talk a little bit about human waste. What do you think human waste is? Is it cumulative or non-cumulative? I'm talking about human waste, uh, whether or not it, or whether it's treated with a uh, treatment plant, like in the picture here on the left, or whether it is uh, entering into our environment untreated, like the picture on the right. Right? Is human waste a cumulative or non-cumulative pollutant? Well, the answer is it depends. Right? It depends on how much of that human waste we're talking about, because human waste can actually be broken down by the environment as long as it's in a, a low enough uh, quantity. So, in other words, once this waste gets submitted into the environment, right, there's some natural processes in the uh, water and soil that will break down this waste, again, as long as it's beneath the assimilative capacity of that environment. So, if, again, if it's a small amount of human waste, then it's considered a non-cumulative pollutant. As soon as we stop producing the human waste, it's gone, and any human waste that is uh, currently in the environment will get broken down naturally by the uh, environmental processes of, again, the water or soil that it's in. Right, but if we have an excessive amount of human waste, so much so that it's uh, uh, exceeded the assimilative capacity of the environment or is uh, overburdening the environment with the amount of it that's out there, then it becomes a cumulative pollutant. It will continue to exist in the environment and pollute that environment long after the source is shut off. Right? So again, there are some uh, things out there, there's some potential pollutants out there like human waste that are non-cumulative if it's below the environment's assimilative capacity but is considered cumulative if it is above the environment's assimilative capacity. Continuing on, the next uh, series of definitions we're going to talk about are point source versus non-point source pollutants. So point source pollutants are pollution for which there is a well-defined point of discharge. So an example of that might be smokestacks at a plant. So if you're driving down the highway and you drive by a chemical plant, you see a bunch of smoke being emitted from the smokestacks, Right, then of course you can identify exactly where that pollution is coming from. That's a point source pollutant. Right? Uh, a non-point source pollutant is pollution for which there is no well-defined points of discharge. In other words, this is pollution for you, uh, where you don't know exactly where it's coming from. 
So if you have a large number of farmers who are spraying uh, chemical pesticides and fertilizers on their crops, and then the rain comes and uh, that chemical runoff enters into the uh, uh, local river or stream and pollutes it, then you don't know exactly how much of uh, these chemicals came from each farmer. You'll know exactly where this agricultural chemical runoff came from since there's a lot of people out there doing it. Right. This might be an example of a non-point source pollutant. In other words, you'll know exactly where this pollution uh, originated from or where the original source is located. With that in mind, which do you think is going to be harder for the government to regulate? A point source pollutant or a non-point source pollutant? Well, again, if you know where this pollution is coming from then you can, and you can identify its source, then you can probably more easily regulate it than if you don't know where it comes from or have a harder time identifying its source. So point source pollutants might be easier to regulate compared to non-point source pollutants. And then the uh, last list of definitions that we're going to be talking about in this class uh, for now are continuous versus episodic emissions. So continuous versus episodic emissions. So a continuous emission is reoccurring emissions as part of a regular production process. Um, you can think of uh, continuous emissions as the kind of emissions that you might see from an electric power plant or waste treatment plants, right? There are emissions that come out every day as a part of our normal way of life or uh, normal way of doing things. The kind of uh, emissions you see uh, coming out of the exhaust of vehicles as you drive them around as part of your daily life, that is another example of a continuous emission. So these are reoccurring emissions that happen regularly uh, every day as a part of the way that we live our lives. Compare that to uh, episodic emissions, right? These are emissions that occur as a result of a one-time accident or incident. So you can think of an accidental oil or chemical spill as an example of episodic emissions, right? So um, you all are probably old enough to remember the uh, big uh, deep horizon oil spill of 2010, which is uh, to date the largest marine oil spill in uh, the world's history, where 4.9 million barrels of oil were discharged into the Gulf of Mexico. That's an example of an episodic emission. It's not something that happens uh, uh, every day. It's something that happens as kind of a result of a freak accident and uh, certainly is damaging to the environment. So when it comes to like what's the government's responsibilities for controlling these different kinds of emissions, uh, with continuous emissions, the policy issue here is how to manage these rate of discharges. So the government knows that these are happening. The question is, how much should they allow? How much should they interfere in our, uh, our everyday lives in order to control these kinds of emissions? That's kind of the policy question for the government when it comes to continuous emissions. When it comes to episodic emissions, the policy question for the government is more about uh, how to try to prevent these um, uh, particular emissions from happening. So what kind of regulation should we have in place to ensure that things are being done as safely as possible in order to kind of uh, prevent these from occurring, or at least minimizing the chances of them occurring? So that's kind of the policy issue when it comes to episodic emissions. So make sure you know the difference between a continuous emission and episodic emission. Be able to give me examples of each on the uh, exam. Right, so that's it for this chapter. Again, this is a short one because we're just going over a few terms and definitions. The chapter is going to be uh, much longer from here on out, at least all the way up until the last one or chapter eight. So uh, from here, know the difference between renewable and non-renewable resources. Again, be able to give examples of each. We talked about solar power as being a renewable resource, along with things like uh, timber stands or fisheries. And then we've talked about things like uh, petroleum deposits or non-mineral uh, deposits as being examples of non-renewable resources. Uh, know what an intertemporal trade-off is, or the idea that our current uh, actions could affect what happens in the future. And understand what we mean by sustainable. Sustainable means that our current actions are not reducing our future opportunities, or in other words, they are not shifting in that production possibilities curve. Understand how to read a production possibilities curve and how it relates to environmental economics or that idea of sustainable. Again, if that production possibilities curve is staying where it is or shifting outwards, that's considered sustainable activity. A sustainable activity. If that production possibilities curve is shifting inward, that is when we are no longer being sustainable. Know the definition for assimilative capacity and understand that because there is a certain amount of pollution that the earth can uh, handle without suffering any severe consequences, that there might be an optimal rate of pollution that is non-zero. And again, we're going to practice calculating that in Chapter 5 of this course. Know the difference between a non-cumulative and cumulative pollutant, right? Remember that a non-cumulative pollutant is a uh, form of pollutant that 
uh, only exists as long as the source of that pollution is present. As soon as we shut off the source of that pollution, then that pollutant goes away, whereas the cumulative pollutant continues to exist in our environment uh, after that source of pollution is shut off. Make sure that you are able to give examples of each. We talked about noise pollution as an example of non-cumulative pollution. We talked about plastics in the ocean, radioactive waste as examples of cumulative pollution. And then, of course, we talked about human waste as a potential example of both, depending on the quantity of that human waste relative to the uh, Earth's assimilative capacity. And then finally, know the difference between continuous and episodic emissions. Remember, continuous emissions are emissions that occur as part of our everyday production process, whereas episodic emissions are usually the result of some kind of freak accident. And again, be able to give examples of each. The exhaust that comes out of our cars are an example of continuous emission. And once again, uh, oil spills or chemical spills are an example of an episodic emission. All right? again, kind of make sure you know the uh, policy issues for both as well. Where the government's job is trying to uh, regulate those continuous emissions, make sure that they're not too severe, but understanding that they are a natural part of the way we live our lives. Whereas with episodic emissions, the big policy issue there is what kind of measures should we take to, uh, to decrease the chances of these happening or to try to make sure that we prevent them from occurring in the first place. So that is it for chapter two. Again, it's a short chapter, so it should be a relatively easy week for you. Uh, again, starting next week, we're going to get more uh, into the uh, – microeconomic theory, which means we're going to get much more into the math and graphs of how all this stuff works. So if you're a big fan of math and graphs, uh, get excited for that. If you're not, don't worry. We're, I'm going to walk you through it as best I can to make sure that everybody uh, learns this material and starts off on the same page. All right. But again, that's it for now. Please let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to shoot me an email or join me in those uh, Zoom office hours. Until then, make sure you're staying safe and healthy. Uh, let me know if you need anything. Take care.